This is part one of a general audience talk uh, about the strange world of quantum mechanics. This is a talk I gave live a couple of years ago, and I'm now putting on YouTube. It's a, a talk focusing on some of the foundational and philosophical issues of quantum mechanics, and in particular what's strange, counterintuitive, non-classical, and seemingly paradoxical about it. Um, so here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about a couple of key experiments that are at the, the heart of when you learn start learning quantum mechanics from any perspective, uh, but very simplified schematic versions. Uh, talk a little bit about the resulting unsettling conclusions we draw from that and the fact that it's telling us that the quantum world is very different from classical mechanics. I'm going to talk about a very brief little history of um, quantum mechanics from a foundational per point of view in terms of how we try to understand it at a very foundational level. And I'll talk about two famous paradoxes. And then I'm going to talk about uh, something that people don't really know very well, which is a modern way of thinking about quantum mechanics, and in particular those paradoxes, which um, is an interesting attempt at resolving how you might think about those. So here's the first famous example, a famous experiment. The stern gerlach experiment, going back to 1921. Um, and versions of this happen all the time nowadays. Uh, this is a very idealized, schematic, simplified version. Um, the thing we have to know about electrons, that what we're going to do is we're going to shoot a beam of electrons between two magnets. And all we have to know is that it has what's called spin. And I'm not going to talk uh, at all about the real mechanics of spin. You can sort of picture it as a little thing spinning, but that's a classical picture and it will be misleading. You can also sort of picture it as simply an arrow uh, pointing up or down or in some direction that kind of indicates the axis of the spin and the direction of the spin, um, whether it's going counterclockwise or clockwise if you, when you look along the arrow. Again, that's going to lead you in a classical direction. It's pretty can be pretty misleading. The main thing is we're just going to need to know that when you put an electron beam through this magnet, apparatus where not notice the north and south uh, poles of these two magnets are different shapes. What that does is it gives a non-homogeneous magnetic field. Turns out that what that does is the electrons either shoot up or down. And all we're going to say, all we need to know about the electron spin, whatever that is, is that those are the two things that can happen when you go through this apparatus. Um, and so it's called a two-state system. There's basically two states it can have, although we'll, we'll see it's getting a little more complicated than that. Um, I'm not going to talk about quantum computing per se right now, but if we did, this would be the start of that talk, where uh, this is called a quantum bit or a qubit, uh, something that can basically take two different states. So here's what we can do with this kind of apparatus. Let's say that this axis up and down here is the x-axis. And what we're going to do is, is we could use this apparatus as a detector. A, an electron comes through here. If it gets deflected upward, we say that its x spin is up, or we just abbreviate that as x plus. Um, and we're going to talk about y in another direction in a minute. Don't worry. Um, so that's one thing we can do is we can detect what state this electron is in. Is it x plus or x minus, x up or down spin, along the x direction? So we've chosen to measure the x-ness of the spin. You can roughly think of that as, is the little arrow along the axis of the spin pointing up or pointing down, roughly? Um, but it's better to just think of it as some sort of abstract property that can take either the plus or minus answer. We can also use it as a filter. Uh, it's very easy to do that. We can create a beam with specified spin in the x direction, either x plus or x minus, along this, this x-axis by just doing this just put a, a block, but just put a uh, you know a, a f some sort of thing to block the electron beam here. Then this beam will be pure up electrons. It will be things where the x spin is up. Okay. So what do I mean by the x spin versus some other kind of thing? Well, we've chosen this magnet orientation along a certain axis so that the n is up here and the s is down here. Well, what if we rotated that 90 degrees? And let's call the axis pointing into the screen and coming out of the screen the y-axis. And what if we rotated the apparatus that way? Well, then we still discover that we shoot some electron beam through there. We get things either going towards that s pole or towards the n pole. And I've, I've, I've mis, I think I've uh, mislabeled these. It doesn't really matter with respect to the s and the n. One of them is what we're going to call y up, and the other one we'll call it y down. It's not really important which is which. So. 
when we choose to measure in the y direction, we get two answers as well. And when we choose to measure in the x direction, we get two answers as well. Okay, let me give you a classical analogy to this because it's really not important exactly how the mechanics of spin and magnetic fields and all that kind of thing works for what I'm talking about. Let's look at a very simple classical analogy. We're going to throw darts at a dartboard. And the dartboard has four quadrants. The, the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And so they're, they're coming back through here and we're seeing them in perspective. That's why they look like parallelograms. And a detector is just the analog of the detector just says, do you hit the left side or the right side? That's one, an analog of the Y plus Y minus detector. Is it more towards the into the screen or out of the screen? And another detector would say, just answer the yes, no question, is it on the top half of the board or the bottom half of the board? That's analogous to the, uh, the detect using the, the detector that's the X plus or X minus. A filter would be just take some cardboard or something, or steel, depends on how, how hard you throw the darts, I guess, uh, to block half the board. So here's an example we could have. We could have a bunch of darts being randomly thrown by some dart thrower. Then we could put a top-only filter here. So this is to indicate that this is where the cardboard is, and there's a gap here, a little window. Okay, so that's going to let maybe half the darts through. And then maybe it goes through another filter, the right-only filter. And that's going to let a half of those darts through. And then we can predict pretty easily, classically, where the darts are going to accumulate on this dartboard. They're only going to show up here because this is guaranteeing that the, the question, the answer to the question top or bottom is top. This is guaranteeing that for these darts coming through, their answer to the question left or right is right. And so it's going to be the ones that, all, that are in this top and right section of the dartboard. So that's exactly analogous to um, what we're going to what we're going to see in the Stern in setting up Stern Gerlach experiments in sequence. Okay. So, let's do a really simple one first. We have a random source of electrons and we put it through an X plus only filter. So, now I've got a very highly schematic picture. This is the whole magnetic field apparatus and everything. And this is the filter version where I, I uh, separate the beam into it the ones that have the X spin being plus and the ones with X spin being minus and I just kill the ones with X spin being minus. So now I want to make sure I've really got what I think I've got. I put it through an X detector. I put, th put it through a filter, or not through a filter, a detector, that's going to tell me what is the X spin. Okay, well, it, they all go up. So that makes sense. I've killed all the ones where the X spin was minus, and that the fact that the X spin is plus is still carrying through here. The fact that I'm kind of squeezing them back on line here is just so that it, the pictures don't get very complicated, so I can put these on the same horizontal line but moving the electron beam doesn't affect it. There's plenty of ways to move the electron beam that don't affect the spin. So we've prepared, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prepare a state right here. We're trying to prepare a bunch of electrons in a certain state. The goal was to prepare them in a state where if I measure X, I get plus, and I've succeeded in doing that. So far, so good, okay? One really important note to, to note here is that we detect electrons in discrete identical lumps and quantized means just just the discreteness here the lumps the lumpy nature of it there's no fractions of electrons it's not a sort of a continuous smear of electron ness it's they really are lumps so they spit out and we detect them in um, discrete bunches like if you hear a Geiger if you imagine a Geiger counter it goes click 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 it isn't just a sort of a steady stream of electron ness and that's going to be very important for for later okay here's a second slightly more complicated or just a different um, steren gerlach experiment. We have our random source of electrons. We put them through the X plus only filter. So this separates it out into the electrons depending on their X spin, the spin along the X direction. And we kill the ones where they're minus, just like we did before. Now we put it through a Y detector. So this is a different detector. This says, well, what about, what's the characteristic of spin if we measure it along the Y axis? So this is very, very similar to uh, in the, oops, no, oh, here we are, it's the same picture. Actually, I shouldn't click ahead, though. Very similar to the, the discussion here. Um, I'm looking at things that are measure in one direction and then things that measure in a, in a different direction. So let's go back to, where is it? Here we are. Okay. So I've got the X plus electrons here, and then I detect their Y, and I get half plus and half minus. That's interesting. And it's 
probabilistic. It's uh, what's interesting here is that it's not just a sort of a, a steady stream of electronness here and a steady stream of electronness here, and it, they're half as strong. It's that these discrete lumps, half of them go here and half of them go here, and it's there's no guarantee that they go here and then here and then the next one here and the next one here. It's not systematic at all. It's just that if I do 100,000 of electrons, I'll get 50,000 electrons here and 50,000 electrons here. So it's discrete. There's these lumps called electrons, these particles, and it's probabilistic, and it's unpredictable. Well, ideally, we'd like to remove that probabilistic aspect. That's disturbing from a classical physics point of view. But it's not that disturbing yet, because maybe it's just because we don't know enough about each electron. I just forgot to measure or filter for the y spin here, whether it's plus or minus. So this is a lot like um, the dart situation. So here's maybe what we'd want to do is um, we might be able, we might want to eliminate the randomness in a way that would work for darts. So here's what would work for darts. You make sure that the only darts coming through are the ones where they're headed towards the top half of the dartboard. So the top bottom question, the answer is top. And then you filter them to make sure that they're also headed for the right side of the dartboard. So you've prepared a more precise state of these darts. So these guys are very special. They are headed towards the top right-hand side of the dartboard. If we hadn't done this filter, it would be totally reasonable that if, they're if we know they're heading for the top half of the dartboard, it would be totally reasonable to see a probabilistic answer in terms of whether they go left or right. You're, they're definitely going to hit on the top of the dartboard, but half of them will hit on the, the left, half of them will hit on the right. That's, that's really OK. okay? Um, but what if we try to do this and try to really prepare something more precise? to elim hopefully eliminate the randomness. So this kind of configuration for darts prepares a, what we could call a state with the top question being true and the right question being true. The answer, well, the answer to top bottom being top and the answer to left right being right. Maybe that's a better way to say it. That these questions have, this, have these answers simultaneously. There's nothing wrong with that classically. Here's the analog of that in quantum mechanics, though. This is where it gets weird. We start with random electrons. We make sure they're in the x plus state. Then we filter further to make sure they're in the y plus state as well. We'd, we'd like to believe that they have a definite answer to, x, to the x question, namely plus, and a definite answer to the y question, namely plus. So we put them through an x de detector just to double check, thinking it's going to obviously just produce x pluses. And it doesn't. It produces exactly half x pluses and half x minuses. That's really startling from a classical physics point of view. Where did these x minuses come from? We thought we had eliminated the things that had an x minus property to them. Just like in the darts, we eliminated the ones that were head, headed to the bottom half of the dartboard. They're gone, and they're not going to be resurrected classically. But in classical mechanics, they can be it can somehow is resurrected. Okay, so here's what we wanted to do: we wanted to prepare a state so that all the electrons coming through here, right before they hit the detector, had both the x plus property and the y plus property. That the x spin when we measure it, which can be in principle plus or minus, is plus, and the y spin, which could be plus or minus, is definitely plus. We tried to guarantee so that these properties were true simultaneously, and it turns out to be impossible. And it's not just in this particular situation. It's in every, every, every other situation where you could imagine trying to do this. People have discovered that it's impossible to do that. <clears throat> so here's another way to say it. If we measure the x spin alone, this property of just is the spin more towards the x plus direction or the x minus direction. We can get a definite answer. The same is true separately if we try to measure the y spin. Is it more in the, in the plus y direction or the more in the y minus y direction? But we can't do both simultaneously. So <clears throat> here's a, how you often hear that said. We could say, and it's not s super misleading, you could say the measurement of the y spin whether it's plus or y plus or y minus, by that filter. It's essentially a measurement. Um, the measurement of the y spin by the y filter it affects the electron. And in particular, it affects the x spin, even though we weren't trying to measure that. Here's why that's not incredibly a good way to, to say that. It seems to imply that there's sort of a dynamical effect that's crucial, that we're tweaking the electron, we're kind of pushing it around in a certain way that inevitably makes it wiggle and change to make the x spin um, change from what we thought it was going to be. And that suggests that maybe we could just to disturb it less. We could ha just have a better apparatus that would disturb it less. But it's not really true. 
And what's really crucial is that this, not, this is not coming from any details about the apparatus, about how we are affecting the electron. And it's, this is true in all cases where this, this kind of thing ha happens. It's really due to the fundamental structure of reality. And what does that mean? Well, it's better to say that it is impossible to prepare a state where the answer to x is plus and the answer is y to plus, where these def have definite true answers. There's just no such state that's possible. There's no way to have an electron in that state. And this is a fundamental way to express what's called the uncertainty principle. There's such, there's such a thing as incompatible properties that being in the x plus state and being in the y plus state are incompatible, that you cannot have them at the same time. Um, and it's actually in a very deep way. It's not just that it's impossible to, to put those together. It's actually meaningless to put those together. It's, e even, it's not even a, a property of the physics so much as it's the property of the logic of nature, which is it's, it's a very, very deep thing. So what, what can we say? What, the y plus state seems to interact with the x plus and the x minus in a certain way. Remember what the stern gerlach experiment was, was giving us. For example, here we come out of a y plus filter. We know that's definitely in the y plus state, and it's half and a half x plus and x minus. Well, um, oops, here we go. We can, in a, some way, say that the y plus state is some sort of mixture of the x plus and x minus state, but there's a better word for it. Mixture implies sort of classical probability stuff that doesn't really apply here. It turns out that the, the correct word to use is that the y plus state is a superposition of x plus and x minus. And superposition is, is kind of a fancy word for sum. And it has to do, in a minute, I'll show you a, a very, very quickly, a schematic model of how this works. Let me just point out, though, that it seems like we're trying to recover something that isn't really true. When we say that a y plus state, oops, I keep going the wrong place. Here we are. When we say the y plus state is a combination in some way of x plus and x minus, whether we call it a mixture, or whether we call it a superposition, it sounds like um, we're, we're trying to reintroduce shades of gray. Remember, I said that when the, the beam comes out, it doesn't come out sort of half simultaneously half in the plus and half in the minus direction. They're all lumps, and each lump has a definite answer, either plus or minus. Um, so it's not really shades of gray. It's important that there are, there's no such thing as you, the electron sort of ha divides in half, and half of it goes in the plus direction, and half of it goes in the minus direction. Whenever you take, you say for any, this example, you have something in the y plus state. That's definite. It will always give you plus for the answer in the y spin. And then you measure the x for e electrons in that state. It won't give you something halfway in between plus and minus. It won't give you zero, for example. It'll always give you either plus or minus. But the probability is what replaces the idea of shades of gray. And so classically, like with the dartboard, Here's an important difference. The darts can show up. Let me have a dartboard picture here. The darts can show up like really far here up, up the top or m sort of top or really close to the middle. They can kind of smear out in a distribution that's smeared everywhere. What's really different about between this and classical and quantum mechanics is that there's kind of it's as if there's only one magical place in each one of the squares of the dartboard that, that it can hit. Um, and But it, it, it's the probability is that it's half over here and half over here. There's no darts that are kind of in the middle. So that's an interesting thing about quantum mechanics. And yet, even though you can't be halfway at, between x plus and x minus, the y plus state seems to kind of want to replicate that. But it doesn't replicate it by having a, an intermediate value between fully plus and fully minus for x. It just says, I'm going to half, half the time I'm going to give you x plus and half the time I'm going to give you f x minus. So here's a schematic diagram. Uh, I just couldn't resist putting this in here, even though I'm really not going to take off from this very much. Um, because this is actually, this is really the honest to God picture that you use to analyze this situation. It's not just a, a convenient fiction, it's actually the start of the real math that, it, that is involved here. It turns out that it's an accurate schematic picture to take these two properties, x plus and x minus, and represent them as perpendicular lines in a, per, in a plane. Uh, which might seem weird from if you think about how x and y and plus and minus axes are usually put in a, in a plane. This is different. The x plus property shows up as this horizontal line. The x minus property shows up as this vertical line. It corresponds to a very general rule that mutually exclusive properties 
like x plus and x minus are exclusive. You can't be have a spin to be measured both plus and minus at the same time. Those show up as perpendicular lines in a diagram like this. At y plus and y minus are also mutually exclusive with each other. You'll never measure those together. Those show up as different a different pair of perpendicular lines. And y plus shows up halfway in between the x plus and the x minus direction. And that's a it turns out to be a precise way to encode the idea that y plus is a superposition of the x plus and the x minus state. And it turns out that a fundamental way to talk about the uncertainty principle is that when you look at properties like x plus and y plus, the thing about this diagram that tells you you can't really make sense of the statement the electron was simultaneously in the x plus state and the y plus state, the reason you can't do that, it turns out that they're not either perpendicular or parallel. Um, and you, it's not just that, that the statement it was x plus and y plus simultaneously is false, it's that you can't even make sense of it. That's pretty weird. Um, it turns out that this kind of picture can be extended to like a higher dimensional picture and it describes basically uh, the, the fundamental structure of any kind of quantum, mecha me quantum mechanical system. And it turns out that quantum mechanics at its heart is really just linear algebra, which is not the most sophisticated branch of mathematics ever invented. And it's actually kind of cool. The quantum mechanics, even though it's really weird and counterintuitive, and there's definitely some things that are very much unknown about it, at heart it reduces to linear algebra. That's a good place to stop the part first part.